Bem-vindos to one more episode of the Type Theory for All podcast. This is your host, Pedro Abreu, and in today's episode, me and my co-host, Eric Bond, have a great conversation with Dan R. Gika, a professor at Birmingham University and, and director of the Programming Languages Research Lab of the Huawei Research Center, Edinburgh. We talk about his work on both institutions, which includes topics such as category theory, strings diagram, game semantics. We also briefly discuss the current publication process of our field and entertain some thoughts on how to make it better. Finally, we also touch on a more personal topic such as his views about elegance, making an insightful counterpoint to Kono's opinions on the notational semantics versus operational semantics. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, welcome everyone to one more episode of the Type Theory for All podcast. I'm your host, Pedro Abreu, and today with me, I have a co-host. I have Eric Bond on my side. Welcome to the show, well, Eric. Thanks, Pedro. It's good to be back. Dude, where, which company are you working now, right? Again, I, I always forget. I'm still currently at um, 26 Technologies as a research scientist in formal verification. Oh, cool. Two six technologies. You're doing some Isabel stuff, things like that, yeah. Some Isabel, some Agda, and some even Cock Prover as well. Oh, a little, exciting. like a little bit of everything. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, and today with us, we're gonna be having an amazing conversation with Dan Gika. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to to be here. You you hosted my my colleague and friend Anupam uh, a few weeks or months ago, and he gave uh, uh, he he talked very warmly about about your show. So I'm very very happy to be on on the podcast. Oh yeah, we had an amazing time. Then um, Anupam is such a nice guy. It was amazing. He is. He is. I'm very happy to have him. I'm I'm very happy to have him as a colleague and a friend in in Birmingham. Right. So you're also friends with Thorsen. I've known Thorsten a long time and we're friends, yes. yes. Nice. Actually, so you, you actually work both in Birmingham and in, in Huawei Research Center? Yes. I am a professor at computer science at the University of Birmingham, where I work uh, one day a week. And four days a week, uh, I lead the programming language team uh, at the Huawei Research Center in Edinburgh. It's actually impressive to me that you, you have some sort of formal methods lab over there. What's going on? It's not a formal formal methods lab. It's a programming language lab. So we are looking at state of the art um, research topics on in, in programming language. So things that are not yet wildly, widely implemented in programming languages, but they are on the verge of, of being able to transfer them into mainstream programming language. So I'm thinking things like, um, probabilistic programming, effect handlers, uh, automatic differentiation. We don't do a lot of uh, fundamental research, but we do look at, uh, at, at advanced topics from the literature. Sometimes we, we have to do our own research so, so that they would fit with our own internal business goals uh, and objectives, and we aim to transfer all these into mainstream um, into mainstream programming language products. So you kind of have your languages that will give support and add new features, things like that. Yes, I can't. I can't talk about details because I don't have like proper PR clearance for for the project. Like I cannot be construed to make announcements. All I can say is that all the work that we do in my team is eventually uh, meant for open sourcing and publication. So everything that you do. You will find out about it at some point. I just cannot tell you exactly when uh, and what. I can just give you um, give you the big picture. So we are a, we're a programming language team, and we're part of a much bigger programming language and compute and uh, compilers laboratory, which has um, which has teams in several in several parts of the world. Of course, most of most of the team is based in in China. Uh, but here in, in Edinburgh, we are the most research active team in, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, programming, uh, programming languages uh, uh, and compilers uh, laboratory. 
and we are we have we're very research intensive. Most of the people who work in my team have uh, PhDs and have research experience. And by the way, if it's not too uh, if it's not too inappropriate, we are currently hiring on a either senior or junior uh, researcher in my team. So you know you can also uh, think about this uh, this podcast as an extended ad and a, and a reverse interview where I tell you about me so you know what it would be like to work <laughs> with me and if you like yes. what you're hearing send us a send us i just posted on twitter a link to the application it's on linkedin and uh, and feel free to apply we're we're very uh, looking forward to uh, to welcoming a new permanent member in the team well awesome so definitely tell us more what what are the kind of people that you're looking for what are the sort of of, of work that you're looking for to do there I'm, I'm looking for people who have broad qualifications in, in programming languages. So I noticed that people in my team who do very well have a um, theoretical background, but they're not completely naive about implementations. In particular, having some degree of familiarity with C++ or Rust is very important. Do they need a PhD? Yes. For what I'm hiring now, yes, it's a, it's a, it requires a PhD, uh, and it's also a senior position. So, fi- ideally, five years of postdoctoral or industry experience, but it can be, uh, it can be also a junior position straight out of PhD. Right, you're definitely looking for someone with a, with a strong background in programming languages and features and yes. C++ specifically. Yes, yes. Right now, we don't do a lot of verification. It's it more like straight programming languages, compilers. And, uh, particularly, we work at the level of intermediate representation of compiler. Is it some sort of LLVM? No, much higher than that. Okay. Um, like, for example, I think a, a, a point of comparison would be like F Lambda in OCaml. It's it's just a, um, if, you, if you start with a complicated programming language that has a very refined um, surface syntax is very, it's not impossible, but it's just, it's just difficult to do analysis and optimization at that level. So the first step is to do a very aggressive desugaring in, um, into a simplified programming language, but it's still, it's still a programming language where you have lambdas and, and you have high level operations. It's not something as low level as LLVM. So, for example, in this language, it's very at this level of abstraction of the language. Is the the easiest thing is to uh, specify complex transformation. For example, closure conversion, or things like automatic differentiation. Automatic automatic differentiation. If you want to go do it on the surface level, is very complicated because the language is very. It's, it's got lots of lots of bells and whistles. And if you go down to something like LLVM, is is too low level. So for th- something like automatic differentiation, the intermediate, a very high level, intermediate language is uh, is ideal. So for example, for Swift, for for Swift, you have something called ISIL. For Haskell, you also have a very high level intermediate language. I forget, um, but it's it's higher than LLVM or MLIR. Actually, so you're 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 currently doing work for two different institutions, right? You're you're both yeah. in Huawei and you're you're also in Birmingham. How does that work yeah. in the sense of is it is it similar research or doing both of them or it, it, kind of it is quite separate? Similar. No, it is it is the topics of my research are quite similar, but the thrust is very different. So in, in Birmingham, my research is very theoretical and I'm working on uh, Things like applied category theory and game semantics, whereas in in industry I work much more on technology transfer. We don't really have any, we don't spend a lot of time doing purely curiosity driven research. Um, I think they were we're not like Microsoft Research used to be in the in the good old days of Microsoft Research. Um, we are we are on, driven by projects and uh, we. Uh, they're not necessarily short-term projects. They can be long-term. I mean, if you look at the track record of Huawei, uh, there have been research projects that have, you know, been developed inside the company for more than 10 years as research projects. For example, the recently open-sourced uh, Harmony operating system for, for mobile and IoT. Uh, and then eventually people decide, okay, it's ready for um, for becoming uh, an actual industrial strength 
widely distributed uh, product. So, so that's what that's what our research is. Even if it is theoretical and long term, it does target a particular application point at some determined point in the future. Like as if you're you have the concerns and the interests of the of industry. You know, like yes. They they need to get some some value out of it. It makes a lot of yeah. sense, and also yeah. like your your students that you advise at Birmingham sometimes can also. Um... Yes, they they did take turns to be and and uh, sometimes they they work here as interns, and sometimes it it fits it fits their PhD because in Birmingham they can work on um, theoretical topics and if they come here they can concentrate on just on implementation of their work. And the good thing about it is that when you come, when you do a full-time internship, your PhD program hits a pause button. So if you have a six-month internship, then everything about your PhD is, is on hold for six months. And this is like, it allows you to do six extra months of research, uh, which is, it's also paid better than, than a PhD student stipend gives them a foothold in industry and, uh, you know, gives them the opportunity to implement something. Because I think for people who who do theoretical PhDs, as my students in Variable do, it's nice to have prototype implementation, but it's too time consuming. You cannot really do deep theory and complicated implementation at the same time. It's, it's just too much. So this gives them the extra time and the extra resources uh, if that's suitable for the research uh, to do a to do a prototype implementation as well, that's really good actually because you know having a researcher with this broader background where he can actually work in a team that is doing some larger larger application, right? And then yeah. you can actually have that experience of working in a larger team on a larger code base and how to maintain a good code base. That's really yeah. good. It's really good yeah. for. So I, I do have three interns right now. No, in my team, I have now five time, five interns, two, two part-time, three full-time, and two more full-time interns starting uh, this month. So we have a lot of interns. And the interns love it here because, to be honest, because you, you cannot put um, an intern on a, on a critical path because, you know, it's, you cannot rely on interns. They, they get the most interesting, the interns get the most interesting and the most exploratory projects. And sometimes they kick kickstart something that can be really interesting. And in that case, they can remain associated on a, on, on a part-time basis with us uh, for, for a longer term, if it's an interesting and, and viable uh, longer term project. But it's always, for them, it's always interesting work. We try to make it as related as possible, but not it cannot always be identical to their PhD. Sometimes it's roughly in the same area. And uh, yeah, we our interns have always been um, very happy here. Uh, for interns right now, because uh, the UK government is very slow in giving visas, yes, I kind of only recruit UK-based, but in the UK we have a lot of um, programming languages and theory uh, PhD programs, so this is a good... So if anybody uh, of you guys, uh, if you're doing currently a PhD in programming languages and you're interested in doing an internship, also let me abuse uh, Pedro's podcast and advertise. Uh, there's no deadline. It's very flexible, uh, but it has to be, at least to begin with, it has to be full-time. Oh, I see. To begin with, it has to be full-time so that it yeah, actually gets the, the full immersion. I, I, yeah, I had some part-time interns from the beginning, but those don't work. It's too They're too distracted by their, as they should be, by their regular PhD work. So a good project can carry on part-time, but to start... To start, I require full time presence and in person. In person, yeah, yeah. We we work kind of mixed. I, I work we, we work mixed from the office and from home, but you know, you I expect people to come reasonably regu- regularly to to the office as well. Especially at the beginning, when you're getting used to to the tools exactly. and, and the people. Exactly. So, um, you you also mentioned that you do a lot of theoretical research in in Birmingham. Yes, and automatic differentiation and applied categories. No, I don't. I don't. Like, automatic differentiation is something that I do. Uh, I I do in in uh, Edinburgh, and we're actually implementing some really 
exciting and innovating AD uh, pro, uh, algorithms. But in Birmingham right now, I'm um, the thing that I'm probably most active. There's two things that I'm actively interested in. One is computation with constructive real numbers, uh, and that is uh, l- basically led and driven by my uh, PhD student Todd Todd War Ambridge. And the second one is is string diagrams and um, especially string diagrams for uh, monoidal closed and uh, trace monoidal categories. String diagrams have been studied a lot in the context of compact closed categories, but compact closed categories are not a good model for programming languages. They're they're kind of a model for systems like think things like electrical circuits, monoidal clo- uh, whereas monoidal closed and trace monoidal uh, categories are very suitable for system in which you have a very well-defined notion of causality. So you can identify the inputs and the outputs of your, of your system, whereas um, compact closed categories are good for modeling things where they don't have a clear input and output. So think quantum systems, think electrical systems, whereas electronic systems have a very clear input and output. And then if if you try to model using compact closed categories, you get you basically get degenerate models. Right. Right. I don't I don't know that much about category theory. So I'm always always trying to to you know like fill the gaps on how why why is it useful in this particular context or or why is it being interesting to talk about this compact close or mono, 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 how do you say that mono, 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 right so category from my i'm not the, i'm not a category theorist but i use i use basic category theory quite quite a lot and and a categorical account of something is a recipe for a model so it's not an actual model but it's a it's a recipe for a model what does it mean to have a model of something it's an axiomatization, and it's a good it's a good language for these kind of axiomatic specifications. And usually, what you have is you will it's 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 just like in compilers. You have a surface language, you have an intermediate language, and then you have a a backend code generation. A category you can think of category theory as the intermediate language of everything. You can start with a phenomenon, and you can distill it to some axiomatization. And you can think of that axiomatization as the categorical model. And once you have that axiomatization, you can generate the concrete model. And you can see that that concrete model fits the categorical axioms. And it's actually, this is is good in two ways. So the categorical model is often abstract. But in computer science, we generate concrete models which are computational, that you can actually run them. The categorical model is just a specification. It doesn't run. But also by inst- by creating successfully a concrete model that also tell you kind of by general methodology of model theory that your categorical model is not degenerate. Because if you create an axiomatization of something by throwing random axioms, uh, you may end up with degenerate in the sense that um, the only models uh, that satisfy that specification are degenerate in the sense that the equate everything. All your objects are equal. All your morphisms are equal. And obviously, if everything is equal, it will satisfy all the equality, but there's no differences. It doesn't make any distinction. And that's how, in my, kind of throughout my um, career, that's how I have used. And it's like, uh, it's like in compilers, you can say, why do you need an intermediate language? Can't you go directly from the front end to x86 assembly code? And yes, you can. You can, but it's just very complicated. So for me, categorical, using category theory is just good mathematical engineering. It gives, you a, it gives you a good bridging point, and usually the categorical models tend to be uh, very simple, not, not necessarily easy to understand, by simple in terms of their descriptive complexity. Much simpler than a language that you try to uh, model and much simpler than x86 x- x- code or whatever your back end is. It gives you a nice, concise way at which you can you can um, think about your 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 situation, and that can be code like a programming language, but can also be with my student George K. We're studying categorical model of of digital circuits. 
uh, and people have been studying categorical models of quantum computing, of quantum communication, even of electrical circuits more recently. Uh, a lot of these nice, uh, nice research, you can find it in the Compositionality Journal and in the Applied Category Theory Conference. It's a very, uh, very nice community that's trying to promote the use of category theory as a language for science. Uh, so, you know, I think I, I think I can name John Baez as being kind of the figurehead and the leader um, of this movement. And he has very, very many brilliant uh, uh, ideas for uh, using category theory as a language of science. Actually, following up on that, I was just at a AMS mathematics research community in applied category theory where John Baez was one of the leading investigators for... Right. Yeah, it was John Veyes, Valeria de, Pada, de Paiva, and Nina yes. Otter. Yeah. Yes. And John Eric Baez Finster group. was there too? Was Eric Finster there too? I actually do not know. I didn't see him around. Okay. Because they um, have this uh, recently started this Topos Institute, which yes. is dedicated to uh, promoting the use of category theory and applied category theory as a, as a, as a language for science. There was probably about half of the uh, folks involved in the Topos Institute there. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Either either yes. remotely or in in person. I think it's a brilliant initiative, and I'm uh, I'm very fond of uh, applied category theory. I think, like anything else, a category theory can can sometimes be excessive. It, it's how much information are you trying to pack into the specification of a model. It's, it, in some sense, it's a matter of common sense. It's a matter of an, you know, having a, a good sense of mathematical engineering. Where do you draw the line? What do you specify? Where do you leave it up to the implementation, which would be up to the concrete model that you use? Uh, so things like uh, monoidal categories are very uh, broad uh, classes of, um, I mean, they cover a lot of systems. Um, because they give you basically a monoidal category. It gives you the sensible axiomatization of what it means to have sequential composition and parallel composition in the same system. And it just gives you the, the correct, the sensible interplay between them. So if you have a system that has sequential composition and parallel composition, and if it doesn't fit into the format of a monoidal category, then something is really weird about it. You're not formulating, most likely, you're not formulating the problem properly. And I don't want to be fundamentalist about it. Maybe, maybe in, there's an off chance that it really isn't. But this is the kind of, this kind of information that you get out of category theory. It, it makes you question some assumptions and makes you say, okay, we, we have some recipes that work in a lot of instances and if, if it doesn't work in your particular instance, it, it, make you, it makes you ask, why doesn't it work? Do I, you know, am I asking the wrong question? Or is it really, am I really on to something that's extraordinary and special? And that, it's also a good thing to know, I guess. It gives you guidance. Category theory gives you guidance. It holds your hand. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah. Category theory is, is so abstract, but it definitely captures a lot of, a lot of those concepts. I wish I wish I would do more more work on that. I've I've also I've also noticed that in, on Twitter right now there's a lot of people are talking a lot about string diagrams and I've seen that you, yes. you do some work on that as well. Is that category theory too? What is that about? Yes, Str string diagrams is probably one of the most beautiful things to to come out of category theory. So string diagrams is a graphical representations of terms. And that, that's something that I, I feel very strongly about. And actually, I, I gave some talks about it on this topic. And I can maybe put them in the links at the end of your show for people who want to uh, see this presented in, in more depth, if they're interested. But the idea is that syntax is a data structure. We have thought, which is an, a very abstract and intangible thing, and in order to represent thought, we do need syntax. That's how we communicate. Uh, and as humans, we use syntax, which is, um, it is linear. It's linear and sequential. And in the, in the lingo of programming, it's a serialization. So think of you have a data structure and you serialize it. You flatten it into a sequence of symbols that can be 
communicated by speaking. Like when we speak, we communicate by a sequence of symbols. And there's no other way you can speak other than a linear sequence of symbols. So our brains are very wired to sequential linear representation of, of thought, of syntax. On paper, that's no longer the case. You can draw things. You can do go 2D. Uh, and also, as a computer, when you process data structures, you almost never want to represent them in, in this kind of linear sequence of symbols. Uh, that's why the first thing that the compiler does when you give it, when you give it text, it's, it's not going to work on text. It's going to parse it, which means transform it into a graph-like structure. The, the very simplest mode in which you can represent syntax is an abstract syntax tree, which is a tree. Now, for reasons that are a little bit too elaborate to describe here, but I will, I'm going to link them, when you deal with programming languages that have very well-defined structures and they have aspects of it such as sharing of information, such as abstraction of information, a tree is not a suitable mode of representation. You also have recursive bindings. So a tree is not a suitable way of representation. And the way to represent it is something that I sometimes call abstract syntax graphs. Sometimes I call hierarchical hypergraphs, but they have a particular mathematical structure. And what is nice about that mathematical structure, and you can arrive at it through two journeys which are completely independent, but they take you to the same place. One is to start with abstract syntax trees and think, how can I improve these so I get the proper sharing and the proper encapsulation of information? But the other way is to say, I start from the language of a um, monoidal closed category and I represent it graphically. Uh, and this kind of representation of... Uh, of um, of monoidal closed category starts from an idea that goes back to Paul Andre Melies. So he has a paper. Uh, I don't know exactly, but if you remind me, uh, I'll put the link to the paper, which is called. Well, you can you can, you can just search it. It's Paul Andre Melies. It's called functorial boxes. So the idea is you can you can represent you can have string diagrams with boxes uh, kind of drawn um, that represent functors, and by some kind of very beautiful coincidence when you represent when you when you when you take a programming language you give it a you give it its categorical uh, interpretation and then you represent that categorical te- interpretation graphically as string diagrams you arrive exactly at at the same drawings that you would if you would just did some intuitive or common sense optimization of the abstract syntax tree it's not. It's obviously it's not an entirely a coincidence. This is, uh, but it's nice that the same concept can be supported by by different uh, by different uh, intuition. I did teach an entire course about this aspect at the Midland Graduate Studies School of Research. So that happens in uh, in the Midlands of the UK. It's a consortium of research universities that includes Birmingham, and it's a it's a summer school, which well spring school because it's in May every year. And it's really, really excellent. If you guys, listeners don't know about it, I strongly represent, recommend it. I think it's it's as good at OPLSS. OPLSS, I think, is more famous, the one in Oregon. I taught at both. Uh, and I, I can, uh, of course, sentimentally, I'm more attached to the one where my home institution belongs to, the one in the Midlands. But honestly, I can tell you it's a fantastic event. And if you're looking for some some way to to improve your, your theoretical uh, uh, education early on in your PhD or at any point in your career. You know, people from my team uh, at Huawei also uh, attended it to learn some, some theory stuff. It's, a, it's an excellent, uh, it's an excellent. And I, I hope I, based on the course that I gave, I'm preparing some extensive, um, some extensive course notes, which I hope in a few months, they're not ready at all, but I, I really hope that in a few months, uh, they will be in a, in a state where I can uh, where I can publish them so that um, uh, oh yeah there is there is an upcoming there's up, upcoming research paper that we have in the next 
uh, FACD, formal structures in FACD, formal structures, I don't know, I forget what that is. It's, uh, formal structures in computation and deduction, right? So it's, um, it's a pretty good conference. So technical details are going to, are, it's part of uh, the Flock conference. Uh, it's a big confederation of logic and semantic conferences, which is this summer. And this summer is in, is, is in Israel, in Haifa. So yeah, it, it's gonna be published there, and uh, you can uh, you can see all the all the details. But now to to kind of wrap it up, why, why this for me? Why is this interesting? It's interesting theoretically, but it's also interesting practically because it's a these kind of string diagrams for monoidal closed categories are an excellent intermediate representation for a compiler. So in fact, this is the intermediate representation that we are using. It's very good for algorithmic purposes. It's not really clear to me what makes it so good. Um, what, what properties that it have? And... Uh, good as opposed to from what point of view? I mean, it's good in, in, in several. So it's, it's good in a mathematical sense. Uh, and the way in which it is good in a mathematical sense is if you look at, if you look at the literature to see how many for how many intermediate languages of compilers and how many intermediate representations have been fully formalized, like in Coq or whatever, you will find very few. This intermediate language, we managed to uh, fully formalize it in Coq and also the intermediate representation. So the data structure, we formalize it in Coq. And that is good. That is kind of, the fact that you, in principle, maybe you can formalize anything in Coq. But sometimes if things are not good, if they have too many exceptions, if they have too many corner cases, if they're too complicated, then you end up not being able to do it just because it takes too much work to do it. And for us, we could do it and without expending huge amounts of resources is because you have a well-understood mathematical structure, which is the monoidal closed category. And if you add sharing to it, which is called Cartesian product, you get what's called the Cartesian closed category. And pretty much all programming languages live inside Cartesian closed category. So on the one hand, you have your Cartesian closed category. Now, on the other hand, you want to have some efficient representation of the terms. And that is the string diagram. It's the string diagrams are because they're a graph-like structure, they're efficient in the same way that text is like, think about text and working with text. It's not efficient, right? We, we like in, in computer science, most of the algorithms are on graphs because graphs or the graph-like, like whether you call it a tree or a balance tree, they're all graph-like. They're not lists. Like lists are very, they're very nice and useful data structure. And of course you can flatten every graph-like structure into a list, but sometimes in a, in, a, in a data structure, you need to jump from various point to various points. And that's very difficult to do. You have a, in the list, you have the overhead that you have to move up and down the list to find places, whereas the graphs gives you. So algorithmically, it's just a, it's just a much better, much more useful. It allows you to do, um, uh, to do complicated algorithms efficiently and because you can relate it to this categorical model you can formalize it and you have a measure of comfort that it's something that's sensible yeah i'm, I'm not saying it's the only thing that's sensible but but other as far as i know other uh, formalizations of intermediate representation so that the actual data structure that's inside the compiler are, are very hard to come by the um there was something, so I was, uh, back to the Midlands thing, I was actually uh, attending the Midlands school and was uh, in your lectures and was really interested to see the uh, functor box representation. Um, but yeah, so is, is part of the um, nicety about the, the formalization, I, I remember you saying that this has, um, you don't have to deal with like substitution in an annoying way in variables. Exactly. I, I was wondering if exactly. you could speak to some, if you could speak to that. Yeah. So substitution, uh, if, if you think about category theory in the language, so, so the, the operation of substitution, which in, in terms of manipulating terms, text is a very complicated operation. At the categorical level, it's 
usually modeled just by composition, by the operation, by, categor by the categorical operation of composition. And the categorical op operation of composition in the language of string diagrams, it just means linking two graphs together through a shared edge. And that's it. So you can you can see you can see how something very complicated at the at the at the point of terms becomes something uh, algorithmically very um, implementable uh, if you have the right data structure for it. So another another thing that also I've noticed that it's a common theme on all of your research is the notion of of game semantics. Does it does it have to do on how does that play a role here? Yes, yeah, so game semantics. Okay, so that takes us to the to, to the initial trigger of of this uh, invitation that you had, which was a was which was a comment that I made uh, when you advertised Connell's um, Connell's interview, and I was very intrigued because I've I've met Connell one Connell once, and I know he's quite a, he's, he's quite a fascinating character. So I, I met him I, I met him when he was working. He mentioned very briefly he was working. For a for a for a hardware company that was trying to design chips according to Minkowskian geometry, which first thing when when I heard it, it was it it seemed it sounded like a scam almost. It sounded insane, <laughs> something that you that you used to bamboozle investors. But but actually it was it was actually it was actually a sensible idea, which I don't know is if it's it, I don't know if it's going to catch on or not because it's a brilliant idea because. The thing is, when you make a when when you make a chip, nothing on a chip is instantaneous because of because things happen at very high frequencies. Whenever you have space, distance, you always have a delay. So since you don't have a notion of simultaneity, it makes sense to to think of the chip somehow in relativistic terms. So so it was a, it was a nice idea. I don't know if it was uh, how far they got with it, but. Uh, uh, but it was a nice idea. And anyway, so yeah, I, I, I met him very briefly. So, uh, but I, I listened to his, um, to his podcast and um, I, I, I think there, there was something that uh, I, I found myself, I mean, two things that I objected to and I would like to express my objections now with apologies to, uh, to Connell because obviously he's not here so he cannot, he cannot reply, but uh, maybe you're planning. He actually specifically asked me to interview you before he, he, he come back because I, I have a plan to have him back. Yes, for, for very, some good, other things. very good. So he will <laughs> reply later. I was going to ask you because at the end of his interview, you said you're going to have a follow-up. Yeah, yeah. That's and I was wondering if it's, yeah. I, if it's a pity if that follow-up already happened, but you didn't yeah, publish yeah. it yet. But <laughs> if, he can, if we can carry on this... Uh, this uh, this dialogue by proxy, I think, is brilliant because I like I like dialogue by proxies. I don't really like debates where people are yeah. kind of interrupting each other and trying exactly. to make hot takes. And I wanna I want you to be comfortable here to yes. express all of yeah, your opinions I, without being exactly exactly. So I mean, I should preface this by saying that I'm a big fan of Connell and his work, and mostly I am in agreement with the things that he's saying and his broader judgments that he makes on the health of our discipline, which I think it's problematic. And I'm happy to talk about that if we have time. But he, he said, I think most of the things that he said, uh, I agree with, and I, I, I don't need to reiterate. But the two, the two things that I want to object with, uh, with all due respect, which are quite, quite related, are the following. The, the first one is that he uses this concept of, or these this word elegance, it should be elegant. He uses it a lot. And actually, I disagree with that on a fundamental basis because elegant is a subjective term. We don't judge scientific theories by elegance. We judge scientific theories by effectiveness. Uh, one theory that was rejected on the basis of elegance was Copernican uh, mechanics. When Copernicus, well, actually not Copernicus, but when Kepler said that, well, so Copernicus had his kind of heliocentric model, uh, but it was actually, it was extremely imprecise. His heliocentric model compared to, to the epicycle model was a lot less precise. It had a lot more error. Uh, so people thought, okay, it's, it's rubbish. Uh, and then Kepler said, no, these are actually ellipses. And then people said, this is not elegant. Circles 
are an elegant data structures, a, 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 an elegant geograph geometrical shape. You look around at the sky, the planets, everything is a circle. You're proposing ellipses. Ellipses are, are, are ugly. They're a fudge. Forget about ellipses. Well, ellipses might be less elegant than circles, but I think it would be crazy. I mean, now we think it's like you cannot reject just because it's an ellipsis and not a circle. And, and here the point is, and, and that's something that we do all the time, and you see that in referee reports for papers when they say it's not intuitive, it's not elegant. What it means, really, it's a translation of it doesn't correspond to my expectation. It doesn't fit what I have already learned. Uh, I cannot translate it in my internal language of biases and prejudices because how do we rate something as elegant is is when you recognize something in it. It's very hard to see something completely new. Usually it is going to freak you out a little bit. And in science, I think we have we have always this kind of debate on the size of elegance. Of course, of course, sometimes elegance and kind of purely mathematical development have led to good things, but equally they have led to bad things. I think uh, there is a there is a very interesting book by um, by Roger Penrose, which I'm reading now, which is called Fashion, Faith, and Fantasy, where he's very critical of string theory. So string theory is 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 something that I don't know I don't know a lot about but what i read about worries me because and that's a point that Roger Penrose is making it's it's guided by by some deeply subjective sense of mathematical elegance but my mathematical elegance sense of mathematical elegance is maybe not your sense of mathematical elegance so what do we do what do we do then uh, maybe I have an algorithm written in C that does some brilliant pointer manipulation, which is super efficient, and I think it's very elegant, and you can't replicate it in Haskell at all, because in Haskell, being a functional programming language, the only data structure that you have in Haskell is trees. Every data structure in Haskell is trees. Now, trees are beautiful, and, and you can capture a lot of information, but sometimes you want DAGs, Sometimes you want cycles. Sometimes you just want arbitrarily uh, arbitrary graphs. But all these data structure are not inductive data structure because they're not inductive data structure. You just can't represent them in Haskell. I mean, look at look at the literature for functional programming doing graph manipulation, and it's it's laughably complicated. I think you would be hardly pressed to say these are elegant solution compared to the kind of programs that you can write by juggling pointers in C. When you juggle pointers in C for graph manipulation, it corresponds directly to your intuition. And because it corresponds directly to intuition, you can say it's elegant. It, it matches the way I think about it. Whereas in Haskell, you, you have to wrap it up in some complicated encodings and representations. And yeah, you can call it elegant if you want to, if, if all you speak is Haskell, you can say now it's Haskell, so there, therefore it's elegant. But but you can see how how you have some kind of barrier that uh, which one is elegant. And I think in in science and in engineering, we solve that debate simply by running some benchmarks. And if your Haskell program is fifty times slower than the C program, uh, you know you can you can go take your propaganda elsewhere because nobody's gonna buy it. Nobody's gonna take a solution which is 50 times slower or 50 times more energy intensive or 50 or 100 times more memory intensive uh, because you make a case of it being elegant. Being elegant doesn't cut any kind of, it, it doesn't make any, it's, it's not a good argument and it's never been a good argument. And I think, of course, all things being equal, all things being equal, we want things to be, we want to choose the solution that's more familiar not the one that's more extravagant. So we should lean towards whatever we consider elegant. Otherwise, we want to lean towards something that has, in some measurable thing, is better. Is it faster? Is it cheaper? Is it formalizable? Like, for example, the case that I made uh, about the intermediate language and the intermediate representation that we're using, we did manage to formalize it. And that's a that's quantitative, at least in terms of manpower. You know, like I could do it with a small amount of manpower, not with 20 people working full time for five years. 
right? So it, it is something quantifiable that you can bring to the table. And it's not, I think, I think overemphasizing the overemphasizing the elegance is is a bit. I think it goes against established science in science, established methodology in, in science and engineering. There's a there's a role for elegance, but not. It's not the first role. It's just all things equal, then elegance. So that's my first point, and if you wanna if you wanna ask some some questions like if what I said is maybe not entirely sensible, uh, I'm I'm happy to to elaborate. No, actually, I I definitely I definitely agree with you. When he was making that point, that was this this notion of of ellipses definitely popped in my head because I remember that clearly that. At some point, there was this big scientific discovery that was kind of hand waved because it was not elegant enough, but it was it was what it was, right? Well, yeah, I mean the the standard the the standard model or the standard model of particles in physics, it's hard to say it's elegant. I mean, it has like what thirty two <laughs> constants, like thirty two <laughs> numerical constants, which are just derived by measurement. They cannot. They, we don't know how. Could, yeah. That's not an elegant. If you have like thirty two buttons that you have to tune. It's not elegant, but but still, it's it's very difficult to say have this, have this other theory which is elegant, except that it doesn't work. I mean, you can't really, mm. you cannot <laughs> do that seriously. If you make right. it work, so yeah, the the point the point that triggered all of this discussion was about game semantics. So I like to tie that knot. Yes. Now. how does it? Right. So one of the things that that um, that Connell spoke in support of elegance in programming language is the fact that there is a denotational model. But I think I was a bit I, I was a bit surprised that he didn't really explain what a denotational model it was and it, it stayed a little bit mysterious. What is a denotational model? So let me let me just let me just start by clarifying what a denotational model is and why do we need a denotational model. So in programming language, you can very easily. So the way it was motivated historically is by compiler transfer, by compiler optimization. So I have some code A, and I want to change it to some code B, uh, which does the same thing, but faster. So there are two things in order to validate the compiler optimization. You need to to validate two things. Number one that A and B pre and post optimization compute the same thing or behave in the same way, and B, that B is faster than A. The second one is, is extremely complicated, so usually it's just dealt with by using benchmarks. The first one right now is a lot of time is dealt with by, by testing, but testing is, is not really uh, very good because sometimes what, what happens with these compiler transformations that code A and code B they, that transformation should be valid in every context of your program. So you don't know in what bigger program your piece of code A lives. So that bigger program, it's called uh, it, the context. So you say that A and B are equivalent if and only if, for all contexts, if I plug in A and I execute, I plug in B and I execute, I always have the same result. And if they don't terminate, then both of them don't terminate. Right. And now this is this uh, this is called like in the literature, this this definition is sometimes called observational equivalence. And it's it's very impractical because you say for all contexts, where these contexts are huge, complicated syntactic objects. So that's a huge quantifier. You cannot really work with that definition. So now the idea of denotational semantics is that I'm going to translate my code, my syntax, into mathematical objects. And if this translation is sound and compositional, then A and B. So first I, I kind of solve my meta theory. So I prove things like soundness, adequacy, uh, completeness. So I prove all that, but I prove it once and for all. And then I take a, a piece of code A and I interpret it into a mathematical entity. I take a code B, I interpret it into a mathematical entity, and their interpretation should be equal as mathematical entities. So I go from a notion of equivalent, which is defined with a complicated definition, I boil it down to, to something that's hopefully much simpler, 
which is equality of two mathematical structures. So I go from A, observational equivalent to B. From that, I go to the interpretation of A is equal to the interpretation of B, where equal is your normal mathematical equality. There's no mystery there. Okay? So that was kind of, that was kind of, that was kind of the idea. And now the question is, how do you create these mathematical interpretations? One, with the, one, part of the, one of the earliest approaches was domain theory, which was started by Dana Scott and, uh, and, and Christopher Strachey. And it's, it's a very developed mathematical theory, but it's, it's a mathematical theory that it's really focused on interpreting recursion and recursive data structures. It is completely, completely unsuitable for modeling imperative computation. So I have I have done my when my uh, in my MSc degree I, I did some work on interpreting and doing this kind of domain theoretic interpretation of a fairly simple a very a fairly simple language, but it, it's higher order and imperative, and uh, the mathematical the denotational mathematical models are actually and are very complicated using functor categories, and now. There's two aspects here. First of all, uh, first of all, the models themselves become very complicated, even for simplified languages. So it's unclear that this methodology is, is even applicable. But you can say, okay, like uh, I don't want to make a straw man, but pre- pretending I'm con, like I say, well, okay, if you don't have a good domain theoretic model, then don't use these features. Just use the programming language as a syntax for domain theory. And so, okay, fair enough. But there's a deeper problem, and these were uh, theoretical results from the from the late '90s, which show that even for fragments of PCF, where PCF is a simply type lambda calculus with if statements and arithmetic and recursion, so it's a very very simple core language. And this language has a denotational model, but observational equivalence and therefore equality are going to be undecidable. So even though you can map code into mathematical objects, you don't have a decision procedure to test those two mathematical objects for being equal or not. So so then you're done. Like, what are you going to do? You, you know that, okay, they're going to be equal, but if they're not effectively equal, it's a pretty heavy blow to the because the the point was that you want to and you want to you want to do this in some sense you want to do this at scale like if you eventually if you're going to put it back into into a compiler it has to be algorithmic you can't really do it by hand it's too much work to take every optimization as a one off to be proved by a mathematician dealing with incredibly complicated mathematical object so so that's kind of that's kind of a, a puts a damper on the on the enthusiasm. Now, game theory was a was an alternative direction to try to come up with mathematical models, denotational mathematical models, which are different than domain theory in the following sense. And that following sense is going to make them or it's making game semantics very suitable for modeling messy and realistic languages. So instead of having this very neat mathematical model of sets and functions or domains and continuous functions or whatever you have it, you're going to say, well, I'm still going to use a denotational model in the sense that I'm mapping my code into some mathematical structure, but those mathematical structure are going to be quite messy combinatorial structures that reflect the messiness of the original language. And these are called strategies. So you define a game and a, a game, what is a game? It's a, it's, an inter, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set of interactions. And the interactions here are between a piece of code. And remember that piece of code lives in a context. So the piece of code interacts with the context, usually by either making fun function calls into the context the context returning from functions or the context making function calls into your program and your program returning. And this gives you sequences of calls and returns. And you can think of the uh, the actions of the context. You can, they're called, the context is called the opponent for some 
historical reason. It doesn't make sense as a, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense as a as a metaphor, but it's got historical reasons why it's called that. So when the context makes actions, which can be called or returns, you call them uh, opponent moves. When your term performs actions, which can be called or returns, you call them uh, proponent moves. And if it's a call, you call it a question. If it's a return, you call it an answer. And what you can do is put some combinatorial constraints on how these, 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 uh, these patterns of actions are related. And combinatorially, you can give fully, uh, you can give full characterizations of your, uh, of, of your programming language. And your programming language can be arbitrarily messy. Like you can look at things like stored continuations. You can look at things like higher order uh, uh, state, very complicated forms of control. Everything just works. It works very, very well. But so it works. And, 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 and in, some, in some point that makes, that, that trivializes Connell's point because if you use game semantics of your, as your semantic domain, everything has a denotational model. It's just that the denotational model, which is going to be as messy as your original language. And because these are combinatorial structure, that doesn't, you know, that rhymes with the fact that equality is going to be often undecidable. Because if I have two combinatorial structures that are equal, I can't always decide the fact that they're equal. They're very, uh, uh, they can be, you know, not all combinatorial structures are testable for equality because these are not finite objects. For example, if I just if I just have you know a function calling its argument, the function can call its argument once or twice or three times, and so on. So it's not a, these strategies are not finite combinatorial objects. I cannot just exhaustively compare them. These are infinite combinatorial objects, for which equality is undecidable. And and in fact, that was my first paper that was to show that the equality of strategies for a for a particular subset of an imperative language was actually decidable. So you could model check observational equivalence, but only for, for a fragment. And then my colleagues at the time, Andre Muravsky and Luke Ong, wrote a lot of papers about finding various language fragments. So start with an arbitrary language. Their observation is undecidable, but then try to kind of cut it down to size with various syntactic restriction, including restrictions on the type system, that would give you decidability of equality, which means that you can you can model check certain properties or model check all reasonable properties of code written in that in that programming language. So if you just say, "Well, we all, we should only use code that has a denotational model," again using game semantics, I can give you denotational model to anything, and you can look at the literature for game semantics. They really are fully abstract, which means sound and complete models for anything you can think of and combinations thereof. Does it help you to have them? Well, well, you, 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 you map your code in some messy combinatorial structure. What you do with that combinatorial structure after that, uh, it's, it's up to you, but it's not going to be easy. I mean, you just kind of did the first, uh, the first step, which is hard enough, but that step, you still have to get into, the, into difficult problems of model theory, basically. Uh, which people have been studying, and it's a it's a it's an active uh, area of research, but it's difficult to see how you can complete the trip going back to uh, compiler optimization. How you can use those insights to eventually having a tool that validates compiler optimization. So that's it's it's still very difficult to do it uh, denotationally. Whether you use whether you get stuck into the limitations of domain theoretic semantics or you get stuck into the complications of game theoretic semantics. They're difficult problems. They're they're extremely difficult problem and apparently the the heart of the, the issue is this notion of context or yes. here game semantics, your opponent, right? It, it makes it actually for me it makes sense that it's called opponent in the the context of game theory, right? You're 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 playing against someone else, and in this case, yeah. uh, you can call it opponent because, in some sense, you can you always worry about the situation when your program crashes, where, where it violates some invariant, and then you can think of your your context being your opponent in the sense that that context is trying to exercise the worst case scenario for you, 
which is crashing your assertion. Right, yeah. You're trying to defend that assertion, <laughs> but the, con- the context is trying to violate that assertion. And in that sense, and that also goes back to semant- game semantics of logics, where you have some propositions, which you are the prover, you're trying to defend that proposition, and the context is an opponent which is trying to invalidate that proposition. And if you have a strategy that's guaranteed for every legal opponent action to defend that assertion, you can say that your assertion is valid. It's, it's model theoretically true. And it's the same thing in some sense. Your program, you can think of it as a strategy that responds to the context in a way that if that assertion is never violated, then you can say, yes, my program is correct. Model theoretically correct. It's a bit like infinite testing against a very powerful and very malicious uh, testing harness. This this idea of of infinite testing it comes back to this notion that your equality here is undecidable. It's not quite clear to me how how, how this undecidability comes comes up. Um, you said that there are multiple calls to your function. I, I couldn't quite follow. I think I I'm afraid I don't have I don't have a simple way to I don't have a simple way to explain that. But if you look at um, if you look at some languages, let's say. Um, languages that have both high order function and even if you just have high order function, you can simply show that in some sense they can encode Turing machines or they can encode some other structure for which equivalence. I think I think even things like context free context free, like push down like context free languages, I think the equivalence of context free language is also undecidable. So all you need to show is that you can encode context-free language. So for every context-free language, you can encode it. And then obviously, if, if you if you had a decision procedure for strategies, that means you would have a decision procedure for context-free languages or Turing machines. And that's not that's not possible. So it's not a, it's not a direct proof. It's a kind of a standard way you do in, in com- complexity or computability where you where you show that you can either encode yourself into a known problem, which gives you decidability or, or upper bounds, or you can encode an a known problem into your approach, and that gives you undecidability or a or a lower bound approach, something like that. It's kind of a standard methodology. You don't usually people don't do it directly. They they do it by by reference to a well known problem. It definitely makes it very clear how how complicated this proofs about compiler optimization and and proving equivalence between programs. It's kind of tip of the iceberg of the sort of things we're doing here in in programming languages research for sure. Is extremely. It's an extremely difficult problem, and yeah, I I I think it's. Um, but it's something that people should not should not give up on. I, I also wanna I wanna say that uh, okay, a slightly slightly unrelated thing that I I think I think Connell was very unfair on operational semantics. Operational semantics really is the workhorse of programming language theory. Things like formalizations of Rust formalizations of even messy things like JavaScript, pretty much all the tools that you find in industry, they all work on the basis of operational semantics. Operationals, a language, when you define it, a language, it has to be on the basis of operational semantics. Because if you go through a denotational model, you don't really have a guarantee that the things that you want your programming to do are even computable. So I can write a denotational model that says, oh, I have this primitive and this primitive rep- represents this function or this strategy is like, yeah, but is this implementable at all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With operational semantics, you have a guarantee of implementability because operational semantics are, are really an algorithm for interpretation. That's all they are. And, and that is a level at which you know you have a programming language. And I know that because I ask people in, in denot- like people who's been working in denotational semantics, like you know, like my PhD supervisor uh, Bob Tennant in, in Queen University in, in Canada, people who have done operational semantics and sorry have done denotational semantics all their career, and nobody's gonna say operational semantics is unimportant. Operational semantics is hugely important. They are. Operational semantics is the cornerstone of, of a specification of a programming language. The denotational model is, you can think of it as an extensional characterization of observational equivalence in that programming language. 
But the programming language itself has to be defined operationally. Otherwise, it's like you don't know what you have. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can define things that are crazy, you know, like operators. You can say, oh, I have a programming language. Oh, here's a function. Equality, like you can, I can specify denotation, equality on functions. Yeah, I can specify that denotationally. Good luck implementing it. <laughs> I mean, how, how are you going to do it? You know, right. it's right. operational semantics is, is, is I find it, uh, and even like if you, if you, if you teach it with, to students, you can very easily specify with operational semantics complex things, whereas with denotational semantics, you can, you can, specify things in a way that's sometimes baffling. So with a poly, well, okay, I'm not going to give the person by name because he's a, somebody who's a, who's a fan of denotational semantics, but, but he told me about this joke of people sometimes calling denotational semantics, renotational pedantics, <laughs> because a lot of time when you look at papers on denotational semantics, you have like uh, the interpretation of the symbol number one is the actual number one. <laughs> and it's just a change of font. Uh, and there's a lot of this infrastructure that seems to be kind of bafflingly trivial until at some point you dive into things that are really deep and complicated. Yeah. So it, it can be, it can take you by surprise when you learn. It's like, yeah, this is for kids. It's yeah, so easy, so easy. Oh, oh, oh I lost it. Now I don't know what to So oh, the, notational, the, the notational semantics in its, um, uh, and its conventional form because it's a, uh, it's it's it really it it really makes sense as a extensional characterization of observational equivalence. It makes sense when you when you interpret terms that have free variables. What is the interpretation not of one plus one? Because the interpretation of one plus one is one plus one, but what's the interpretation of x plus one? What's the interpretation of f of one, where f is a free variable? So that's when when you have the free variables, then those variables are mapped into elements, abstract elements of your semantic domain. And once you work with free variables, then the mathematical machinery kicks in and becomes actually useful and interesting. But as, as the things build up, whenever you have constant and closed terms, uh, the implementation, the interpretation is usually itself. So hence the, hence, hence the unfair joke. Uh, but it's, it's, I, I think it's funny nevertheless. <laughs> the joke is funny nevertheless. No, I definitely agree with you that operational semantics definitely has its use. And how else can you know whether you're, implement, you're going to be able to implement your language or not? It also seems to me that when we were talking in, in, in private, in our private discussions, you also have some more strong opinions on syntax of program languages and, and this gap on teaching and practicing of, of compilers. What are your thoughts on those? Oh, we, we already covered that when we talked about string diagrams. The string diagrams is what I wanted to drive to. Drive to. Uh, and I did, use, I did use string diagrams in teaching uh, compilers in undergraduate class. Uh, and um, the reaction that I got from students was excellent. I think, I think graphical representations in some sense, are very appealing to the student as opposed to term-based representation. It gives you um, a grasp on something that seems more concrete than uh, than a list of uh, than uh, than a term. I I don't have anything else so much to add from what I what I said when we started in the discussion, but except that I I think there are there are three elements. Uh, to syntax, which I promote quite heavily, and I, uh, I I give them this fanciful name of syntactic trinitarianism, in which you have the term the, ter the term representation, the string diagram representation, and the graph representation, which is the graph you can think as the concrete implementation of the string diagrams, whereas the string diagrams you can you can think of them as a bridge between the graph representation, which is a useful, which is an efficient data structure, and the term representation, but it's a particular kind of terms. They're terms in the categorical language which do not have, uh, they don't have variables in them. They're, they're pure combinators. So the language of category theory doesn't have variables. The, the big difference between the language of category theory and the language of concrete programming language is in the concrete programming language, you have lots of variables. And the bookkeeping of variables alone is just overwhelming. You, you'd like you don't want to deal with those variables all the time. 
moving to category to, to the categorical representation takes you to a much simpler language, a language in which specifications uh, of properties is is much simpler. It's much simpler because it's it's it, 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 you don't have to worry about these variables and all the things that they entail, like like things like uh, overshadowing of variables or whether a variable is unique or not. All these things, all these concerns, which are they're not a matter of foundation. They're a matter of mathematical engineering. They're just a pain. It's possible to deal with them, but they're a pain. And when you start doing transformation, when you copy a piece of code, you have to do something. You have to, like, even if you want to use something like the Brown indices to give a more concrete representation, you have to worry about renormalization and, and, and stuff like that. And then, but the but the but the 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 categorical language, the string diagram language, taken as a as as pure syntax, is very inefficient still. It's, it it has too much information, and now you map it into the 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 third one, which is the graph like concrete graph like data structure, and there you can um, uh, you can operate on it algorithmically efficiently and you can implement those specifications efficiently and here is a little bit of ambiguity because there are two the people when they use string diagrams sometimes they mean it as a two-dimensional string syntax sorry as a two-dimensional term syntax which is still syntax sometimes they mean it as a data structure so you 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 have to be but but the the mapping between the two of them is so seamless that it's almost no problem if you conflate them because you can switch between these two perspectives so comfortably so and so and so easily so i, I have a question on i guess maybe the the string diagrams for a simply typed lambda calculus as they appeared in your lectures in mgs which i think i don't know if those are online but they'll probably be in your lecture notes they they, they will be, they, i took them offline after the mgs because they're very much a work in progress like literally it just ended abruptly didn't even have a conclusion or anything so i'm what I'm working on now is is writing a chapter on applications. I want to show how you can do type inference, closure conversion, yeah. and automatic differentiation on string diagrams, and write the conclusion, and then hopefully I can I can post them after that. So, is there um, any kind of like upper bound or ceiling at which you have a sufficiently expressive type theory which makes working in the string diagrams a pain, or where the string diagrams like it's harder to represent like certain uh, features. Like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, I mean, a dependently type setting would be yeah. a stretch, I would imagine. But like, yeah. what about like a system F or something like this? That is a great question. And I don't have, I don't have a, good, a good answer because that's just something that I don't think anybody looked at it yet. Mm-hmm. There, all, all I can say, maybe just a bit of related information for people who are interested in pursue, pursuing this as a, as a research topic, because I think it's a possibly very fertile research topic that I don't think it has been breached yet. You have two kinds of things that people call string diagrams. So there's the string diagrams representation of terms, and then there's a there's a string diagram representation of types uh, and computations at the level of types. So there's a there's a there's a book on string diagram available on I think it's available on archive. By by uh, Dan Marston and um, Ralph Hinze, which is really dedicated to this type oriented view of, st- of string diagrams. Whereas I I have been much more into the representation because you know t- types also when you go to complicated type system they have a syntax of their own. The syntax of the type is complicated, and then with me what I've been looking at is like syntax of terms. So I was much more interested in syntax of terms. Uh, and the string diagrams for terms are surprisingly different than the string diagrams for types. Uh, Interesting. String diagrams for types make, make really beautiful. Uh, and then you also, have string, you, ha- you also have string diagrams for kind of higher dimensional features. So there's a very beautiful uh, online proof assistant based on n-dimensional string diagrams called homotopy.io, created by Jamie Vickery and, and uh, many other collaborators. And there you can see how, how this can be pushed 
into into higher dimension and you get beautiful multi-dimensional you can get like three dimensional slices through multi-dimensional graphs and you can get animations and it's it's really like you can you can take this uh this this concept of string diagrams as a visual representation of syntax and push it really really far that's so exciting i actually i, I think i saw that homotopy.io it's, it's, it's .io right yeah homotopy.io you can just you can just go and type it in your into your uh into your browse browser and check it out it's 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 not very easy to use i uh, you can... yeah exactly that was my my issue i couldn't get very far <laughs> You get stuck by like, yeah. what do I do now? Kind of a thing, but you can uh, you can watch videos of right. their talks and you can uh, you can you can see it uh, you can see it in action, uh, and it's uh, it's very cool. Uh, now, something that of course for dependent type theory, you need something that looks both at because dependent types bring together term syntax and type syntax into into one thing. So that I think that would be an excellent an excellent uh, an excellent topic of uh, of research to to investigate and i think it's not just the theoretical research but the whole paraphernalia of tools for specifying and manipulating uh string diagrams right now is extraordinarily primitive we we really desperately need i mean it, we are just at the beginning of the journey we need much better tools we need I think that's why we need we need a wider community. We make to and that's why I'm kind of I'm very happy to speak in this kind of a forum to a not to a specialist yeah. audience, but but to people who are interested somehow. Yeah, who can, who can become interested, you know, because that's a challenge. I'm talking about the graphical formalism in a podcast, so obviously, uh, luckily that stops me for even trying to get into any kind of technical uh, details. But but it's a it's a fascinating, fast growing area. Um, it needs a lot of programming effort, not just theoretical effort. I think I think the theoretic the theory is more or less there, like the basic theory. Right now, the implementation and the software support lags behind uh, uh, lags behind the theory significantly. We really need better tools, um, which are um, which are. Uh, uh, which which allow you to specify, navigate, and also export into LaTeX or SVG or whatever uh, for the purpose of papers and books, these things. So something like Homotopy uh, I think they're leading the way. I'm a big fan of their effort, but but something that a bit for more for more mundane kind of syntax would be uh, would be. So so the guys who implemented Homotopy promised me that they will come do an internship. Uh, <laughs> So I'm expecting uh, I'm expecting great great things from our hopefully future collaboration. It's such an exciting time to be doing programming languages research. Honestly, there is so much room for to discover and to actually come up with new ideas. And there there are many open yes. questions in, in in a way. Yes. But also also during our internal communication, we were also talking a little bit of of the the peer review practice and how it's. What are your opinions there? Because uh, I'm bringing I'm bringing this up right now because yeah. we're talking about you know like welcoming new new people, but it's yeah the way that we're publishing our our research right now and how we're communicating because that's what what publishing is all yeah. about is about communicating our ideas and our results, yeah. right? It's not clear to yeah. me how this is the most efficient yeah. way or how should we move forward and, and that sort of stuff. So. Yeah. I, my, my opinions about this are, are, are quite, quite bad. Um, <laughs> and Good. I want to, I want to, you know, like a lot of people who are in my situation who managed to hack, hack uh, kind of a, a reasonable, a reasonably successful academic career. They think that, because it worked for them, and it did work for me. I don't have a complaint from that point of view. Um, because it worked for them, then it that means that it it works, and it could work for everybody. But I think I there was a huge dose of luck in my career, a, a huge, you know, serendipitous encounters that allowed my career to progress 
sometimes rather effortlessly and i i just i take i can i take no credit personal credit for it but the people who i work with and and the people who kind of steered me onto topics of research that proved to be interesting and and that and that proved to be kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, make a smooth path for getting a permanent position, for getting tenure, for getting promotion, and so on. That's, that's very serendipitous, and you know, in in some sense, that cannot be fixed because there is there is always going to be a small number of permanent position relative to a mo- the number of people who want to occupy them. So, the competitiveness aspect of it, it's going to be there, and some people are going to be succeeding, and some people are going to to be failing, and that's that's unavoidable. Now, I think what what we should try to do is two things: make the process so that the people who are not successful, at least they can think it was a fair process. That they, you know, they they were given a hair hearing, a fair hearing. They had a, a reasonably decent shot at it, which was not the crapshoot, which was not too much randomness. Uh, because right now, what happens if you if you are a PhD student or if you're a postdoc, you only have, as a PhD student in, in the UK, the PhD program is three years. Very difficult to be productive in your first year. You're just learning things. In your second year, you're going to be productive. And then you have one year to publish a paper which or two or three, which are going to be significant enough so that you will have the opportunity to do a postdoc. And when you, uh, when you submit to a a journal you can't because the journal delays are so long that by the time your paper actually appears, <laughs> you finished. You maybe you know sometimes it takes five years or whatever. It's not practical. You have to go to a conference. You go to a conference and the conferences have acceptance rates rates which are very low, and then they have a review process which is very erratic. Your paper is given to three people who are going to read it with very, very, very widely different levels of expertise, diligence, or just a predisposition to the subject matter that you're tackling or the thesis that you're making. Usually, if, it, uh, if, if you go to, into a, somebody's area, those people are going to say, yeah, that's an important area because that's my area and what I do is by definition important. If it goes into somebody's unrelated area or god forbid a rival area Oof. then all of a sudden i'm not saying that people are deliberately sabotaging paper because they i'm sure they're not but there's a question of bias there's a question of the benefit of the doubt there's a question when when it's a bit of the edge is going to tilt this way or that way and the way it tilts is going to be informed by your biases and the system that we have now with with the it, it's an evolutionary system it started it started in a place where publication genuinely was there was genuine sc- scarcity i mean you had to print things on paper you could not print everything you had to have a program committee that wrote letters to each other and you couldn't have too many people and because you would send uh, the paper copies to each other uh, but now we are in a in a situation in which publication is trivial, communication is trivial, presentation like we do now is trivial. You don't even have to travel anymore, and but we are stuck into a in, into a into a social into a social system, the social side of research, in which we cannot like evolve, because things change too rapidly. We we cannot if they cannot evolve to a situation in which we can take advantage of these of these new facilities that we have new technologies the ability to publish and review and disseminate quickly and cheaply and in a way that we kind of minimize the randomness so that when somebody writes a paper they're not going to be convinced that their paper was rejected just because they were unlucky with whatever referees they were randomly assigned but the paper was judged by a broader section of the community who has a, that broader section of the community can can form a better opinion than three random referees and these random referees sometimes they're not even 
the experienced researchers who you nominate on the program committee, but they can give it to their PhD student or whatever. Anybody can be a, a peer in the sense of peer review, which, you know, you get to the situation when, when, when a very senior researcher can write a deeply original paper, which is given to a, to a PhD student to, and the PhD student says, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. This is, uh, this is rubbish. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it, 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 this can happen and this does happen and it's unfortunate. So I think we're having a lot of, we're conflating with our system of, of publication, two things which are both important. One is dissemination of information so that research can move over, uh, can move forward efficiently and effectively. And the second one is the awarding of points, brownie points or prizes or prestige which is needed for promotion and for hiring. Uh, the way we combine these two things, I think, are, are, I think is wrong. These can be differentiated. You know, like, for example, let's say in the world of cinema, you have things like, uh, you know, things like distribution, which is done by companies, and then you have festivals that give awards. For us, it's like living in a world of cinema where festivals are the only way in which you can get your product in front of an audience. And, and, and that's a bit crazy. Uh, it's it's highly <laughs> artificial true. scarcity. It's extremely inefficient because what happens when people have a paper rejected, they res- they edit it, they try to improve it, and they resubmit it. I have papers that were resubmitted, let's say five times. That means fifteen reviews, fifteen reviews. So it's like, how many people wasted their time reading that paper over and over and over until three of them? coincidentally, and at the same time, manage to accept it, you know? It's ridiculous. I think there should be a much lower barrier to publication. And then you should have, you know, a way of... Uh, somebody proposed once, and I think it's a very brilliant idea. Just put all the papers on archive. Yep. And then journals can read, and then they can just solicit the permission of the author to publish the yeah. paper. Yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and then the journals, basically, they become like festivals. Yeah. Uh, people who look over and select things that are, that are great. And, and then they put it yeah. uh, in and, and then you say, yes, my, and it's not, you don't even call it a journal. You can call it, instead of the conference of functional programming, you can call it the festival of functional programming. <laughs> I love that. And, and periodically, the, the committee looking at papers as yeah. they appear, they can say, yeah, let's, let's, Let's put this paper into the festival and, and let's organize an in-person festival slash conference yeah. once a year. So one, one community which is organizing like this is, the, is a fairly new journal called Programming. It's the Journal of the uh, Art, Science, and something like Art, Science, and Technology of Programming. Uh, and it works a bit like this. So it is like a journal in the sense that if your paper is rejected, you can actually keep a dialogue with the editor's until it gets accepted or until we all agree that it's rubbish and it gets rejected. Yeah. But you don't completely re-review it from fresh. Mm-hmm. And then it's it's accepted. And then, I don't know, if either once a year or twice a year, everybody who has a paper published gets together for an in-person, an in-person meeting to discuss their research. And I think it's a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful way. And it's, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's a vast improvement on what we have now, what, what we have now, especially, especially the highly competitive conferences like LIX, ICFP, POPL, PLDI, they are, um, this, there's too much randomness. And I think the initial allocation of referees is, is too, it has too much weight and it's something that I think we have to, we have to find, we have the technology. We just, yes. we just need the willingness to deal yes. with it. Yes. To organize ourselves towards that. And I think, I think on Kono's episode, I also mentioned my, my point of view a little bit as well, that we've been growing science so quickly in this past century that this, the, the, the most fundamental issue, which is our communication, you know, like how do we communicate our ideas and how do we, do we realize that this or that person is more relevant than this or this other person? And as you mentioned, we've been basically selecting those who has more published papers and also 
um, some sort of relevance towards being cited because it means that he is uh, a more connected graph of, of a sense or, or whatever. But then it raised this huge other questions because then the system started growing way too much, right? And now it's kind of like getting out of hand and this is starting to, it's definitely not making much more sense anymore. So I definitely love this idea of just publishing everything on archive. And now we select a few papers, maybe even someone, we can have people sending and submitting, you know, like nominations, right? And hey, this paper here is absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. You guys open, should take open review, open review. Yeah. We can have yeah. a, we can have a website where people open review. A social media of papers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That'd be amazing. Yes, yes, I think so. I think so. Because to be honest, and, and you know, like, uh, of course you will, if it's open review, you will maybe, you will not get critical reviews, but but you can get, you know, like you, you can look not just at the, quant I mean, right now the, the, the reviewing process is completely hidden. You don't know how competent the reviewer is. So if you have a positive endorsement from a, like a positive review and endorsement from a, uh, from a recognized yeah. figure, you know, it, it, it can be, it can be very, very good, you know? Wow, and even, even if the paper is not very well accepted in the, in this community, then you, you, you have some sort of feedback and you have the chance to tweak your paper and slowly make, make it better. Or like you start, maybe someone working on a related field, look at your paper and sends you some questions. Hey, I didn't quite understand what you're... Let me disagree with you a little bit here, because even if your paper is, 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 what it means for a paper to be accepted by the community or not is a bit vague. So if let's say there are in programming languages that, that let's say there are 30 famous people who are in a position to give postdocs and, and give very strong introductions. If one of them likes your paper, if one of them likes your paper, then that's a huge boost. They don't have to all like it. That's the thing. Like when a with a conference or with a journal, it's more of a statistic. You, you, you need a random sample of three people to like it. Whereas in reality, if you look at the people who are really established and, and let's say famous and authoritative, it's enough for one of them to like your work. So in my case, when I was a PhD student, I was lucky enough that Samson Abramsky liked my work and I was lucky enough that he invited me to, to do a PhD. The same thing with Bob Cookie. Uh, Bob Cookie was kind of uh, wallowing in obscurity as an academic, but it, Samson recognized the value of his work, and Bob Cookie is now a very famous and very successful scientist. But you need somebody to give you a, to give you a break, uh, and in order to have a chance to have a break, people have to see your work. And if your work is not published anywhere, if it's not disseminated, it's very it's very difficult to get that chance. And I think it's. I, you know, there's always going to be a competition. There's always going to be people, more people than positions. But but let's let's try to have at least people have a feeling that the system is fair and and that they can have a fair shot and their voice is is heard academically and their research is heard academically. I think that would be, I think that would be amazing for everybody's mental health. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, everybody, especially PhD students, I would dare yes, to say. Yes. They don't have the time to play these resubmissions. Like I yeah. did resubmit a paper five times. A PhD student doesn't have this luxury. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I'm almost pulling my hair because I'm, I'm trying to resubmit one paper right now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we are starting to get towards the end of this conversation because we have limited time. And is there anything that you would like to wrap up in this final seven, six minutes? Uh, I just want to say hi to Connell. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for motivating me. Thank you for motivating me to participate, in, if not directly, but indirectly to participate. I'm really looking forward to, to his... Uh, to his comments, which I'm sure they're going to be very interesting and very thoughtful. And uh, yes, I, I, it was, uh, it was very nice to, to, to have this, uh, this conversation. Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I, I hope we'll have a chance to meet together in person at some, uh, at, at some of these pesky conferences. <laughs> I definitely hope that as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your insight and and for your your stories and your opinions. All the links for everything that you said is going to be in the description. 
if the listeners are interested to work with you, I'll definitely post post uh, the posting of, of, of how to reach you out. And I think that's it for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eric, as well. Yep. Hope you guys should see you guys next time. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, that's it for today's episode it was a great conversation with dan i hope you guys learn as much as i did i i really don't know that much about category theory string diagrams so it was a good opportunity to get a, a sense of what's going on over there if you liked any of his opportunities if you're looking for a job or thinking about starting a phd take a look at the links in the description because all of those stuff that we talked in the episode is over there if you have any questions for any of us Send it on our on our website, typetheoryforall.com. You can also engage with us on Twitter, at dt for all Send us a message. What did you think about this show? Do you agree? Do you disagree with stuff he was talking about? Let us know. Anyways, that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed. See you guys next time. <laughs>